Hi everybody, it's James. I'm uh, just uh, coming here on Saturday. I uh, had a session and all that stuff, so I just thought I would uh, talk about a few things here. And I apologize again, I had some sort of... I'm just trying to figure out this whole thing here. Um, okay, so uh, today's topics that I'm going to talk about, and, and just coming from a session that I had uh, with this uh, really uh, amazing couple, um, it, it is going to be about uh, dominance, why that word is a misnomer, and then also the other part of, um, which is really somewhat of a difficult topic, which is anthropomorphizing your, your guilt, human guilt onto our dogs. And, and that can be kind of a bit of a difficulty. So um, again, uh, you can see in the comments uh, of my description, I'm gonna be talking about um, why dominance is an incorrect word to use. And it is an industry uh, um, misnomer and then the other part is regards to human guilt. Okay, so uh, I had a session today uh, with a, a a couple that have a dog that is somewhat reactive and, and other issues and so forth like that. And it's it's a typical aspect that happens when a dog comes in from a a rather uh, difficult background. And one of the things they were taught by a, a different uh, trainer, behaviorist, uh, somebody who, who's relatively uh, you know established, um, was that not to let their dog walk before them, not to let their dog walk through a gate before them, uh, not to let the dog walk through the door before them. And they were told the reason why you shouldn't do that is because your dog thinks that they're dominating you. And that's a misnomer. That's an incorrect term that's been used. And the word dominant or dominance is an incorrect term that has been used for a hundred years, a hundred plus years. And that's totally wrong. The aspect of saying that the dog is trying to dominate you by stepping in front of you, by walking in front of you, so forth, etc., is totally incorrect. Your dog is just being a dog. He doesn't, she doesn't care what's going on. If she's happy, she's not having any reaction. She's just going to be walking wherever she wants to be. Going through the doorway, if your dog walks before you in the doorway, it's not a dominant aspect of it. What your dog is actually doing when going into the into the home is they're trying to make sure. Hey, thank you so much for sharing, uh, Lori, into uh, Peace, Love, Danes. Um, so what your your dog is doing is not trying to dominate you. In actual fact, because the dog is a overt codependent and we are covert codependents, your dog is going into the home before you and trying to find out whether or not there's any intruders, anything that's unsafe. And of course, the dog is expecting that it's going to be, okay, we're going to step into our home. Whether or not it's going to be safe or not, I need to check it out. And that's one part that we want to keep in mind. That's why the dog is going ahead. We don't want, we do not want our dog going ahead for that simple reason. We want our dog to rely on us by us stepping ahead. So what I do a lot of times is I'll hold my dog back, one of my dogs, right? It doesn't matter whoever it is, I come back into the home. I will hold them behind me before stepping into my place, uh, stepping into the house. And the reason why I hold them back is because I want them to know, not because I'm trying to dominate them either, and not because I'm trying to, you know, let them know that they're behind me in, in, in aspects of uh, seniority or position in the home. I'm stepping into the home to make sure that it's safe for my dogs. That's what I'm doing to them. So I'm not showing them that I'm uh, dominating them. I'm not letting them dominate me in that sense of it again. I'm just stepping into the home so that I can show to my dogs that I'm protecting them. Then I'm making sure that there's no danger. I'm coming in. I keep them behind me with my hand behind me. And I will look to my left. Uh, uh, so camera left. Uh, I will look to my right as I go in. And I will tell my dogs, okay, come on in. And that's essentially it. So then what ends up happening is I establish for my, for my dog, the dog, is that they're safe to come inside. That I've made sure it's safe. That everything's okay. And this goes back to what I was saying yesterday regards to... Um, on the leash, when you have your dog on the leash and another dog comes to attack your dog, you pull your dog away from them. And if you don't step in between the other dog and your dog, then your dog thinks that you're not able to protect them and that there's a more danger by pulling your dog away. Same thing when we're going into the home is to pull our dog behind us, stepping inside the home, and then he realizes that he's safe. So it's not a dominant part of the thing. Uh, same thing. And I and simply really briefly, because I, I, I think sometimes uh, I got some feedback that a little too much information coming out and I should simplify it a bit more. 
Uh, yesterday, I tried to simplify it as well into human terms. And, and um, you know, I understand that, so I want to simplify it a little bit more. Um, the two is if anybody has a video up of their dog's behavior, uh, I'm going to try to keep this uh, again to 20 minutes. If someone's there, let me know, post it uh, with a little bit of background about your dog, and I can do a live evaluation for you. Um, and actually, Lori, if you want, uh, I'd be happy to do a live broadcast on your group um, for any of your clients. Uh, sorry, any of your members that are looking for a, a live evaluation of their dog's behavior and just kind of breaking that down. Um, so the other part of dominance as well that has always been spread around is a misnomer, and that is the fact of letting your dog walk on leash. And uh, a lot of uh, trainers and behaviors will say, let the dog walk in front of you. Don't let the dog, you know, dominate you by, by pulling the lead and so forth. So there's a couple of things I want to correct. When the dog does pull on the lead, a lot of times it's out of eagerness. Uh, yes, Bonnie, it's, it, this is live right now. Um, okay, so what ends up happening is when the dog is pulling on the lead, it's out of anxiety, insecurity, unsecurity. Uh, um, you're welcome, Lori. Um, it's out of insecurity, unsecurity, anxiety, agoraphobia, fear of being outside. All those things that can cause your dog to feel anxious so that they're pulling on the lead. Another problem with the way people handle the lead is that sometimes they start to spaghetti it up and they start to wrap it up in their hands. And uh, hey, Bonnie. And the dog is feeling an insecurity on the leash itself because you're taking a six foot lead and then you're not giving the dog the consistency of the lead itself. That's another topic. I'll go into that part. But I want to, again, continue on the dominant side of things or dominant side of things. So when your dog is walking on a leash and they're pulling in front of you or they're just walking in front of you, it is not dominance. It's your dog just having fun, doing whatever they want, being a dog and just sniffing around and enjoying it. Unless you're actually training your dog for trick training, obedience training, show or search and rescue, any type of that type of, uh, of uh, training, then you, of course you want to have some sort of control over your dog's um, conduct. But again, just a domesticated dog, your friend, your companion, let them walk any way that they want. There's absolutely no way that a dog can dominate you on leash. That's right. It's absolutely impossible for your dog to dominate on leash because at the end of the day, you, the human being, has control of the leash. So if you're holding your leash properly, which I always do, and I, and I put this out here and I'll talk about it at another time, is if you're holding your leash properly at the full six foot length, that's the extent that your dog can run out to is six feet. What happens when your dog runs out to six feet? you have control that is dominant control of the leash and because you have dominant control of the leash you don't have to worry about what your dog is doing because at the end of the day if you're paying attention you're going to be able to pull your dog back in on the leash you're going to be able to pull your dog in from sniffing at something or trying to uh, lunge at something you're able to pull your dog back in at all times so it's not dominant control it's the fact that we have control of the leash and we just use it the way we want to. Um, again, that's a dominant side of things. I really want to get on to another topic that I um, I was tagged in. Um, and, and I get this all the time. Like I said the other day, is 70% of the people that contact me are pretty well about to kill their dog for behavioral issues. And they have listened to uh, the traditional trainers and behaviors that are saying your dog can't be fixed, your dog is this, your dog is that, uh, your dog won't res respond to treats, your dog is too reactive, aggressive, etc., etc. Uh, and there's no hope for your dog and your dog should be killed. So this is completely uh, a, an unbelievable statement that you would hear from anyone who is especially inexperienced because if they're saying that there's nothing wrong with their dog, uh, but we can't fix your dog from being reactive, so we need to kill your dog, which is something that they call behavioral euthanasia. And this is an incredibly weak argument to kill a dog. Um, so one of the posts that I got tagged in uh, today, which I think some of you know who I'm talking about, um, the unfortunate thing is, the unfortunate thing is, this is such an incorrect aspect. What we're doing is, 
so what the post basically said was my dog is reactive, has attacked, uh, well not attacked, but bit some people. And, and again, by the description of this post, which is quite limited, it wasn't that the dog was biting people and attacking them, the dog was nipping at people. Um, if this person's dog was actually attacking people and biting them, there would be some significant wounds to the individuals and the post would reflect that. They would say, well, my dog bit somebody, they had to go to the hospital, they needed stitches, they were bleeding, etc., etc." The description has been just nipping. And so the, uh, the owner themselves has gone way overboard and basically said, if my dog can't be fixed, I don't have a choice other than to kill my dog. And then other people have said, well, why don't you just rehome your dog? The reply was, I'm not going to rehome my dog because I don't think that would be fair. And I don't think my dog would like that to be rehomed. So it sounds ridiculous to me and to any sane individual out there. It's absolutely ridiculous of a statement to say. So you're saying, and this is what I'm inferring basically, is that your dog can't be saved. And because you don't think that your dog can be helped or downtrained or fixed, quote unquote, you're going to kill your dog. Because you don't think your dog can find a rescue, a reputable rescue, that's going to rehome your dog, your dangerous dog. Your dog needs to be killed. This is a, a materialistic statement to say. This is a anthropomorphization of human guilt. What we're saying is we feel so guilty about the problems with our dog and that we're going to take 100% responsibility and we're going to make sure that nobody else gets injured and we're going to make sure that our dog who only loves us is put out of their suffering, is put out of their misery. Behavioral euthanasia. Now you understand why I see this as a disgusting statement and any trainer of behavior that is familiar with that is pathetic. There's actually a, a, a reactive dog group with about 17,000 um, uh, members in it that I got kicked out of because I said, essentially, any trainer or behaviorist that alludes or even relies on a statement as behavioral euthanasia should not be working. And I spoke with the one of the people, Erica, about it, who's the admin on it. Her opinion was, yep, you deserve to be kicked out, essentially. And I said, so, so you're saying inexperience and stupidity. Well, I didn't say that. I was very polite to her, even though I'm talking about it publicly now. I said to her, these dogs can all be helped. Behavioral euthanasia is a easy way out for the human. It's an easy way out for a trainer or behaviors to say, your dog can't be fixed, so we need to kill your dog. Your dog will always be like that. Your dog will be miserable, etc., etc." And that shows the inexperience of the trainer or behaviors. We want the trainer or behaviors to say, you know what, we can't help your dog, but there might be somebody else, but your dog is not suffering. Because euthanasia is a term meaning to put out of misery due to suffering, due to medical pain and suffering. We're going to put a human being through euthanasia. We're going to put a dog uh, th uh, through euthanasia if they're medically suffering or have some significant issues. When it comes to behavioral issues, these are really straightforward, simple things to, to address. Okay, I get the fact that I'm saying from my perspective. I get it from the fact that I'm working with dogs that no one can work with. And it's not an arrogant statement, but it's because I wanted to help these dogs and these giants and these predators that attacked significantly and wounded people. I've still went through, even if someone said behavioral euthanasia. None of it applies. If you look at the video on my cover, uh, on my page, which is Red the German Shepherd, he got away from his handler, uh, his dog walker, and he attacked another dog and so forth like that. Um, the other two Danes in there, the Fawn and the Harlequin colored Danes, those are dangerous dogs. The Harlequin is an extremely dangerous dog who attacked 16 people in New York. This is a dog that's partially blind. Not at any time did I think to myself, behaviorally speaking, I'm going to have him killed. Because I knew I wanted to work with him. I knew I could help him just by giving him patience and time. And this is a, a, a giant Great Dane, 180 plus pounds, got away from its handler in Seattle, cornered me in the hotel room, grabbed me by the arm, threw all my clothing, still was able to scar me underneath my clothing, 
and ragdolled me. And I'm a 190 pound, five foot 11 guy. I still worked with him and I still down trained him and I was still able to get this giant Dane out in public off leash in a matter of months. Actually, in four days, actually, I did. But uh, getting him out in public and so forth like that, off leash parks, walking downtown, all these things. And there was nothing ever. We had the top, uh, the, the South Han the Southampton Animal Shelter in New York I had contacted numerous trainers and behaviors throughout North America, including one of the most well-known international behaviors that live here in Vancouver that has a newspaper column. Every single one of them turned them said he was too dangerous, he was going to kill somebody. Behavioral euthanasia is a safe term for an inexperienced person to say. It is our guilt of saying, we don't know what to do with your dog, and instead of admitting that we don't know what to do, we're going to just summarily execute your dog by making that statement. It is an anthropomorphization of human guilt. It's us saying our dog is suffering. To your dog, the reality, they're fine. Their behavior, though may be reactive and aggressive to us, is normal behavior for the dog in the canine species itself. To kill your dog sooner than is necessary is called premature death. I just want people to realize that they need to stop encouraging people to kill their dogs and instead just, just spending some time and learning how to address your dog. Because most of the times these dogs, the behavior of these dogs have been brought on by the owners themselves, by the family themselves. By not catching the little things that go on and almost every single time someone says, three months ago he's my dog was fine, and then suddenly my dog started biting people. But it's the little nuances. It's the little things that lead up to it. Just like a child that grows up to an adult that had a bad past, they start developing things that become antisocial behavior. But we can always trace things back to when it first happened. So I want to just, and I'm going to keep hammering on this part of it, where it just, you know, this, this broadcast, last broadcast, the future broadcast, I'm going to say, the same thing. Stop telling people to kill their dog when they have behavioral issues. 20 years ago, when I was a kid, 30 years ago, growing up, there were dogs like that all the time in my neighborhood. In fact, I grew up at the age of six, seven years old, deathly afraid of dogs, like deathly afraid of dogs, because I got chased by one that I thought was trying to kill me. So I have had intense fear of dogs. I'm afraid even with dogs that I see, and I always ask people, is your dog reactive to, to, to people, etc. And when I get close to the dog, I'm always afraid in my head that I'm going to get bitten. doesn't even matter if it's a nice Labrador. I'm always afraid because that's the type of dogs I deal with. But I never go on my and say out loud that this dog is behaviorally uh, challenged and should be killed. Right? Of course, I have a 0% kill rate, a 0% medication rate. I'm just saying, please stop talking about your dog as if your dog is property. Please stop talking about your dog as if your dog is suffering. Your dog is perfectly fine. You know the life that your dog had beforehand if you adopted your dog from a rescue? The reason why your dog went to rescue is because they had a bad life before coming to yours. So that means that the life that your dog is having now is way better than they had before. And then when you people talk about killing their dog, what's the difference? The difference is it's a premature death. The difference is the fact that your dog was not suffering, but that you anthropomorphized your guilt and your responsibility back onto your dog. Um, what else? Uh, there was another thing I want to talk about. I just I just needed to say that just because I, I'm just so extremely disappointed with this industry and the way the industry suppresses any type of uh, cross-discipline education. We've got these two large uh, known accreditation uh, colleges, uh, whatever you call them, and they don't even allow cross-education. They, they don't even allow cross-discipline. So how do you learn from something if you're only stuck one, on one road every single day? It's like driving the same path, same, same streets to, to, to work every single day. And then the one day you get a detour, like, oh my gosh, I'm on a detour, I don't know where I'm going, etc. And then you learn after a couple of detour trips, hey, it's not that bad. 
you know what? I didn't know that there was this really cool strip mall here. I'm going to stop here next time. This is what I'm talking about. Cross education has to happen in dog training. I'm not going to talk about the accreditation places and all that stuff, but I'm just saying cross education must happen. Same with Bruce Lee. Look at what Bruce Lee did for martial arts. Instead of sticking to the old archaic aspects of only follow the Wing Chun martial arts, Bruce Lee learned different martial arts throughout the entire disciplines of martial arts. He learned boxing, he learned, uh, he did running, he did all these kinds of different cross disciplines, and then he became the most influential, disruptive person that martial arts has ever seen and continues to have that influence decades after his death. So when it comes to these accreditation uh, 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 colleges, the problem you guys have is that you're stifling progress and you're protecting yourselves. You're refusing to allow cross education. You, you're refusing to allow influences from others. And that's totally contr uh, contradictory. That's totally counterintuitive to science itself. Science explores outwards. Science doesn't just follow this simple little analog, linear type of direction. Science goes and says, okay, we're going to try this, we're going to try this, we're going to try something else if this doesn't work. But when we continue to follow this path of just sticking to our own little backyard, and you've heard of the acronym NIMBY, not in my backyard, we suffocate. We see six million dogs being killed annually. Six million dogs killed annually in North America. There's just over 89 million dogs living in the United States. 9.4 million dogs living in Canada. So that's 100 million dogs. There's almost 1 billion dogs globally, including stray dogs. 900 million to 1 billion dogs globally. Out of those 100 million dogs that live in North America, about 65 million dogs live domesticated in the homes, which means it's about one and a half dogs per household. It's not including the shelter dogs, it's not including the stray dogs, it's including the dogs living in these homes. So we gotta start looking at things, right? When we're having six million dogs being killed, that's 6%, 5%. So to us, we're like, oh, well, that's not that much of an odd, but it is an important thing to each and every single human being that our dog needs to be happy. and. and um, you know, I just, I just want to get over this part and I'm really, uh, I just really believe that we need to change the way we see dogs, that they're not material, that they're not property, that they are actually living beings that can be quote unquote fixed. Anyone that tells you that they, they're working with their dog and they're going to commit to their dog and they're going to just tolerate and work with these things with their dog, that's the kind of person that you want as your friend. That's the kind of person that you want in your corner when you have a bad day. Because they understand that the difficulties and the challenges that you have with your dog, that your reactive dog is acting this way, they understand where you're coming from. So, sorry, just, uh, somebody sent me a message. Here. So, I, I, anyhow, so, so that's what I want to say. Any, um, anybody got any questions? Anybody got a, a, a video you want me to take a look at? And... Um, uh, Bonnie, do you, do you have a video? Does anybody have a video that you want me to look at? Just let me know if you want to put up the link or something like that, then I can take a look at it or you can PM me it. But um, anybody got questions? Bueller? <laughs> Bueller? Uh, oh, what was there something else I was going to say too? Um, yeah, anyhow. I don't know what else, but um, if you have any questions or uh, any ideas for future uh, articles of, uh, of, um, of the broadcast, please let me know. And I appreciate everyone just tuning in on a Saturday. I know most people are out there having fun and all that stuff. But uh, again, um, you know, just stick with the fact that if you have a problem with your dog, please feel free to ask me. Please feel free to join my closed group. Um, you know, please subscribe to my YouTube channel as well to help get my word out, uh, methods out. And, um, you know, maybe next time we'll talk about Temple Grandin and, and some of the incorrect information that she has out there as well uh, regards to cows and the fear-based aspect that uh, she has not really scratched the surface of that. And I do realize that she is with Tufts University. And, um, again, just the problem is when we have the scientists and the behaviors and so forth following an incorrect path, they just continue that incorrect path. 
I mean, look at the way Tesla was, Nikola Tesla was treated. Look at the way uh, Jane Goodall was treated when she started out. All the scientists, all the academics went after her and ridiculed her and, and made fun of her saying, made fun of her giving names to her subjects. So instead of the uh, instead of the primates being called, you know, three, four, seven, eight, nine, she said, this is George. She was laughed at. She was yelled at. She was ridiculed. Now she has an honorary degree. She is one of the most recognized progressive individuals in the entire animal community, science-wise. Absolutely, incredibly right. When it comes to Temple Grand, unfortunately, she's incorrect on a lot of the things that she's saying. And I do, again, I know she's one of the top 100 influential people with Time Magazine and so forth like that and all that but she's incorrect because her biggest flaw because she's autistic and she freely admits that she's autistic is that she continues to follow the path of belief that animals are like autistic people when you follow a path that's incorrect because she's not taking into account the sophistication of the human brain she's not taking into account the emotional context because autistic people tend not to have a strong emotional uh, 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 possession and drive and control. So she's looking at this part of just like, like I said, scratching the surface. So she's trying to elude the fact that the human sophisticated brain on an autistic perspective applies to animals and it's woefully incorrect. And, um, you know, someone was just saying about me, about not me, about what it was that, you know, they're going down shoots, uh, the cows going down shoots to the slaughter floor and so forth like that. There's just a lot of things just really incorrect. Um, you know, and here's the other part, too, is I can say all these things and people can say, yeah, James, you're just, you know, you're just, you're just saying your opinion. You're saying all these things that have no bearing in life uh, that don't mean anything. These are learned individuals, etc., etc. But here's the thing. Go talk to any trainer or behaviorist. It doesn't matter how good they are. It doesn't matter how they say that they, they work with the most aggressive dogs in the world, which they haven't. Ask them, when was the last time they worked with a predatorial dog that has a significant bite history that they've worked alone with these dogs without any treats or medication? And they will say, no, we're not going to. They're going to say it's too dangerous and we could be killed. I worked with these dogs consistently at 100%. Every single one has happened. So these theories that I have on my end have all applied in real life. They have all worked in real life. And I will do so again. And in actual fact, I am looking for another uh, Great Dane to, to adopt into my family. And I'm looking for a Great Dane that is at least 150 pounds. A Great Dane that is at least 35 or 36 inches at the withers. A Great Dane that has attacked at least six to nine people. That's a Great Dane that I'm looking for to adopt into my home. And that'll be the third one that I will personally adopt into my home, into my life. And I will also effectively downtrain them without treats or medication whatsoever. So if anybody knows of a Great Dane that is significantly aggressive, dangerous, extremely dangerous, predatorial, please direct them to my uh, to my attention. Uh, I've asked uh, Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab Charity, the largest nationwide Great Dane Rescue in the United States, if not the, the continent. Uh, New Hope for Danes here. Uh, I've asked other Great Dane Rescues as well to keep their eyes and ears open. Uh, same with like uh, one Dane at a time. I've, I again have said, this is the Great Dane I'm looking forward to adopt. And these are the Great Danes that are significantly uh, dangerous that will attack with intent to kill people. So um, I'm going to prove it again. But I just want people to understand when you talk about killing your dog or when people tell you to kill your dog, it is such a, uh, a, a, a vacating. Yeah, Save Rocky's awesome, Lori. Uh, killing your dog... Or telling someone to kill their dog. It's really. It's really. Not a very cool thing to do. Sorry I just got to do this. Here. Um, it, it, it's really just not. 
it's not it's not necessary uh if if you don't believe me you know go to my website rfrfbarkbark.com check out the tab for free uh for help your dog and you'll see the stuff that i've read on people's evaluations yeah thank you lori um you'll see the evaluations i've done just by reading owners descriptions of their dog looking at clear photos of their dog and understanding what the issues are and uh, you'll see the accuracy on it and it's not anything magical that I do we can all do it like I said the other day it's like looking at someone's text message and you're trying to figure out what they actually mean by it are they being rude or they're trying to be funny it's the same thing that we do with human beings uh, any so okay any questions no 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 more questions okay uh, sorry for for kind of a low-key Saturday um, just you know the world that I live the world that I live in is is really tough in the sense that everybody that contacts me is talking about killing their dog um, it's not a happy place to be in I can tell you that and uh, you know try to help try to help try to help and so anyhow um, you know have a great uh, Saturday I may do a broadcast tomorrow uh, again if you have any ideas come up to it I know some people have asked what do you do when your dog is barking at the window what do you do when your dog is barking at the door uh, barking out the car and so forth like that so I may talk about that tomorrow actually I probably yeah you know I'll talk about that tomorrow is how to stop your dog from barking at the window and you're gonna go wow that's really simple and I thought so and that's it it's gonna be that simple anyhow um, you'll see tomorrow we'll talk about that part uh, if you have any other ideas let me know if you have any video that you want me to watch a real uh, a live broadcast let me know uh, thank you everybody for a Saturday and until again, bye-bye.